All right, friends, we've got a great hour ahead. As we wrap up this sermon series today, we're going to get right into worshiping our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. Stick around to the end. I have a special invitation for you. And God bless you on the hour ahead. Life is full of things that have the potential to incinerate our faith. They can destroy our love, our courage, our humility, our hope. Are these fiery trials meant to be avoided, feared, endured? Do they mean that God is absent? What if there was a way to not fear the fire or fight the fire, but to be faithful in the fire? What if the fires meant that God was actually near and not far? As we look back to the days of Daniel, we see people faithful in the fires of another kingdom, faithful in the fires of loss, faithful in the fires of worldly education, faithful in the fires of social conformity, faithful in the fires of discernment, faithful in the fires of success, and faithful in the fires of persecution. Could it be that the days of Daniel aren't too different than today and that God has a vision to meet us in the fires so that we can together be faithful in the fire? Well, today we're doing it. We're wrapping up a sermon series, a seven-week sermon series in the book of Daniel called Faithful in the Fire. And if you're joining us today, what perfect timing to wrap up with us, but also know that we have all six prior to this that you can get caught up on after the service. I invite you to go to YouTube, search for Bel Air Church, and you'll see right at the very top some of these sermons that we've been going through called Faithful in the Fire. Quick little intro to understand what we're talking about when we say faithful in the fire. You know, physical fires, they have the potential to burn, to maim, to, to ultimately incinerate. And in the same way, there's there's experiences in life that are kind of like fires, not physical fires, but metaphorical fires that have the potential to burn, to destroy, to incinerate our, our patience, our joy, our faithfulness, God's calling on our lives, our view of ourselves, our view of who God is. And we, in some ways, could just fear those fires or we could try to fight the fires or we could avoid the fires. But ultimately, as we've been discovering, God calls us to be faithful in the fire, because God's strategy isn't just to cause the fires to go out and have us live this nice, easy, comfortable life, but that when the fires do come, to know first that God meets us in those fires and ultimately can set us free in the midst of those fires so that we can be transformed and those that see us in those fires can ultimately come to a saving faith in God.
Now, as we've gone through each of these, last week was the fire of success. And uh, normally you don't think of success as a great fire. And yet we saw last week that success is one of those things that has the potential, doesn't always do this, but has the potential to incinerate your, your humility, your faith, uh, your, your, your dependence upon God. And we saw last week how we can not fear those fires, uh, not try to avoid success, but when we do find success in the same ways that we experience when we experience setbacks, that God can meet us in those moments remind us of our identity and enable us, even if we fail, that God is for us and not against us. And we get to this last one today. And in some ways, this is an obvious one, that God has called us to be faithful in the fire of persecution. Now, in a moment, we're going to get to Daniel chapter 6. And as I think about persecution, uh, I look out on the world and I look throughout church history and I look throughout uh, the, the history of God's people that stretches all the way back into the Old Testament. And we get very clear pictures of what persecution looks like. In the same way, I've noticed something that's happening in our modern culture, that people are applying the word persecution to things that by definition aren't really persecution. And so as we get into Daniel chapter six, I find actually the best definition of true persecution. And as we go through this sermon, I want to provide for us what I might call the anatomy of true persecution. And when we understand the anatomy of true persecution, we can understand when it's not true persecution, but also to know that as followers of Christ, as believers in this world, to not be surprised, to actually expect the fires of persecution to come. Let me read for us Daniel chapter six. And as a setup, as a context, a reminder that King Nebuchadnezzar, many years prior to this moment, wants to annihilate God's people by assimilating them into the Babylonian culture. And so he brings 10,000 of the, the leaders, the uh, the heads of organizations, the people who have great influence. And he wants to assimilate them into Babylonian life to believe different worldviews than what scripture says, to ultimately believe in Babylonian gods. And so he believes the strategy of annihilation through assimilation, that when they have a changed worldview, that will then spread throughout the rest of God's people. And ultimately they will become a conquered people and part of the Babylonian empire. But we've seen Daniel and others, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are able to faithfully follow God, following God's vision given through the prophet Jeremiah, not to assimilate in culture, not to separate from culture, but to faithfully follow God into that culture, praying for its welfare, seeking its peace, longing for God ultimately to transform it from the inside out. And as we've gone through these weeks, we've discovered that King Nebuchadnezzar, the head of the Babylonian Empire, the very one who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into a physical fire, ultimately, over time, experienced the living God. And through a number of steps, abandoned his faith in the Babylonian gods and ultimately gave his life over and believed and worshipped and praised. Now, Daniel chapter Five tells the story of Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar. We're going to skip over that story to get to the persecution of Daniel chapter six, but we find ourselves having had Daniel promoted to the third most powerful position in the Babylonian empire. Something about how he was able to live as a citizen of heaven in the city of Babylon how he was able to faithfully follow God in such a way that garnered respect, that he never compromised, that he had great integrity. This remarkable thing that he was then promoted to third most powerful in the kingdom of all of Babylon. And now we find ourselves in Daniel chapter six, from Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar to now the third ruler over all Babylon and it's King Darius. Let me read for us Daniel chapter six, beginning in verse one. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, 
stationed throughout the whole kingdom. And over them there were three presidents, including Daniel. To these the satraps gave account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Soon Daniel distinguished himself above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to appoint him over the whole kingdom. So already he's been appointed to number three, in power, in all the land. And he lived in such a way with such integrity, with such wisdom in that Babylonian culture that he was perceived by King Darius as actually rising above all the other presidents. And in a sense, before he was put into that position, essentially he was functioned as the number two in the entirety of the kingdom. And that's a great reminder that God has called us into this world not to assimilate, not to separate. And God can, if God chooses, as we follow God faithfully, as we live lives of integrity, as we practice the way of Jesus in our workplaces, in our organizations, in our schools, in our teams, on set, whatever it might be, that we might get promoted and God might have that intention ultimately to transform that environment for God's, for God's kingdom, to make God's self known, for people to ultimately experience the true God. And we're seeing this play out in Daniel's life but then something horrific happens. And it's something that happens around the globe. It's something that happens throughout church history that when people have integrity, are following the way of Jesus, are exhibiting God's heart for the world, people begin to react in a way that is filled with hate, that is the very definition of persecution. This is what happens. In verse four, so the presidents and the satraps tried to find grounds for complaint against Daniel in connection with the kingdom, but they could find no grounds for complaint or any corruption because he was faithful and no negligence or corruption could be found in him. The men then said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. This, my friends, is the reading of God's word as we say every week, thanks be to God. Now, on the surface, it's very easy to pass over, but I believe that this is the best, literally the best definition of persecution and understand the anatomy of persecution as we jump forward to John 15 in a little bit, the best definition and anatomy of persecution found in the entirety of scripture. There's two things here that I want us to take away before we move into the anatomy of persecution. The first is this, uh, that they were not persecuting Daniel. They were not hating Daniel. They didn't want to, um, or they didn't find reason to do things negative to Daniel because of any of the ways in which he acted. Uh, they didn't want to persecute him or destroy him or sentence him to death. Uh, because he lacked integrity. They couldn't find any complaint against him. Uh, it wasn't because he came across as annoying or judgmental or he was full of himself or was full of pride uh, or, or was lazy or couldn't get stuff done. And they looked in every area of his life and he was a man of integrity. He was upright. He got the job done. In fact, in some ways, they kind of agreed there's no guy like him in the kingdom. And yet they were filled with this perhaps jealousy. It doesn't say that, but that's perhaps what was going on. There was perhaps this hatred. He was the only one among the presidents, only one among the leaders, only one among the rulers that wasn't Babylonian by birth. And so they say very clearly, again, verse nine, the men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless, this is the best definition of persecution. Unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Real persecution, true persecution for a Christian isn't people disliking you because you're annoying, because you're judgmental, uh, because you're lazy, because you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Uh, it's because they persecute you for who God is in your life, for who Jesus is in your life, 
that it's a persecution in connection with your relationship with the God Almighty. Now, this is so key because I think a lot of Christians in our modernity will uh, do something as a Christian and they immediately jump to, I'm being persecuted, I'm being persecuted, I'm being persecuted. And my observation, just from the outside, I don't know their hearts, but just it seems like on the outside that the real reason why people are frustrated with them, criticizing them, actually has nothing to do with their relationship with God. It has to do with them being judgmental or self-righteous or somehow making an important thing the ultimate thing or they're annoying or they're just plain weird. And we have to be very, very careful to not lump in every time somebody disagrees with us, every time somebody makes it hard for us and just say, oh my gosh, I'm being persecuted. But Jesus says, the Apostle Paul says, Peter says, do not be surprised when you face persecution in this world. Daniel experienced it. Followers of Christ have experienced it. We're going to experience it. And it's a fire. When you in your workplace, as you faithfully follow the way of Jesus, as you get the job done, as you show integrity, as you walk with humility and courage, as you love people as, your, as yourself out of the overflow of God's love for you, ultimately, you're still going to be different than the rest of the people in your group, on your team, on set, in your school, because the reasons why you do things in some ways are different than everybody else. It's out of the overflow of God's love for you. You'll say no to things that other people say yes to. You'll say yes to things other people will say no to. And you will, in some ways, not fit into a nice, neat box in the ways that the world draws boxes. And so, in this case, they couldn't find any level of charge against them, and so they had to go after his faith and his God. The story plays out. We don't have time to read it. Ultimately, they set up Darius to make a decree that if anyone prays in public to any other God other than uh, to the Babylonian gods, that they have the penalty of death. And so they basically set this all up. And even though Darius loves Daniel, respects Daniel, has honored Daniel, has promoted Daniel, this Daniel faithfully follows his God. And we talked a bit about this in the week on social conformity. You can go back after the service if you missed that one. That there's this truth that when you faithfully follow God in private, it will spill over into public. And in sometimes in those cases, persecution will come. And the leveled charge against Daniel was that he was to be thrown into the lion's den. And what's so remarkable is it seems like Darius doesn't want to do it, but his hand has been forced. And there's this remarkable line in Daniel chapter six. I'd love for you to read this. And it says, then the king gave the command and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. And the king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. You see, there's this mixture of when you faithfully follow God of some people who don't yet know God, who despise you, who hate you, while others notice something about you that they respect. And Darius has great respect for Daniel, even though he, his hands are tied and he throws him into the lion's den. And the next morning, this is what happens. Verse 19, then at break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. He wants to know what's happened. I wonder, it doesn't say it explicitly, but I wonder because he's already said, may your God save you. I wonder if one of the reasons why he hurries to the den of lions is because he thinks possibly, possibly Daniel's God did save him. If that's not even a possibility, why hurry? Why rush when you know exactly what was going to happen? I'm sure the satraps, the other presidents, the rulers, they knew. You can't survive a lion's den. That's why we threw him into it. But Darius was the only one who ran to the den of lions. Perhaps a mixture of hope, a mixture of could it possibly be? Perhaps remembering the stories passed down about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
being faithfully saved by the fire, the physical fire that they were thrown into. I imagine that story was passed down. And here, Jairus, he runs the den of lions. And in verse 20, it says this, when he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel. Another proof, evidence that there is a, a sliver of faith, a sliver of hope from King Darius. Before he can even see in, he calls out to Daniel. Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you faithfully serve been able to deliver you from the lions? You wouldn't ask that question if you were certain he was dead. You only ask that question if there's that sliver of hope. And what's remarkable is Daniel then answers. And listen to, this is what's so remarkable. I, I, I keep coming back to this. I, I want you to, to hear and to imagine Daniel's posture. He's just been persecuted for no reason other than because his faith is in the living God. He has been wrongfully charged. He has all the reasons to be bitter, has all the reasons to retaliate, has all the reasons to be filled with pride, filled with righteousness, to get an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And his response after have just been thrown in the lion's den, I think gives evidence to the kind of character that existed before he was thrown into the lion's den. Listen to the respect, listen to the integrity, listen to the lack of compromise. This odd mixture of things that Daniel has. He says this, O king, live forever respect. It reminds me when Jesus says, when uh, your enemy persecutes you, pray for them. When you're struck, turn the other cheek. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Jesus completely changes the narrative. And long before Jesus was born, Daniel is living it out here. He says, oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and what's so fascinating, let's not leap past this. It doesn't say, my God sent an angel. It said, my God sent his angel. Now, you might remember this from the very first week. If you didn't listen, no problem. Cover it right now. All throughout the Old Testament, there are angels of the Lord. And every once in a while, there's what's called the angel of the Lord. In fact, the first occurrence of this is when Moses, in front of this burning bush that isn't consumed, hears a voice from the middle of the fire, and the narrative in the book of Exodus says, and the angel of the Lord spoke. And then later on in that same conversation, it says, and the Lord spoke. There's this interchangeable use of the phrases, the angel of the Lord and Yahweh, the Lord. And there's this remarkable reality that we see the angel of the Lord pop up in different places in the Old Testament. And whenever people have an encounter with the angel of the Lord, like Joshua, when he has an encounter with the angel of the Lord, he bows down and worships. And whenever someone bows down and worships the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord doesn't say, get up, get up, get up, don't worship me. He lets them worship him. But when angels of the Lord, like Michael and others, when they show up on the scene, you see this in the New Testament as well, when people bow down and worship angels, you know, these created beings, the angels say, don't worship me, I, I'm, I'm created just like you, get up, get up. There's evidence all throughout the Hebrew scriptures that the angel of the Lord is actually the Lord himself the pre-incarnate Son of God. That the voice speaking from the burning bush is the same voice that spoke, let there be light. The same voice that spoke words that the gospel writer John talks about in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. Remember in Daniel chapter three, we've been covering this each week. If you've been with us, there is a fourth figure in the fire, the literal fire. And that figure looked like a God, according to Nebuchadnezzar. 
And after that, Nebuchadnezzar, again in Daniel chapter 3, says, the Lord has sent his angel to protect you. The exact same phrase that we read here in Daniel chapter 6, where it says, 20, verse 22, my God has sent his angel, not an angel, his angel, and shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. It wasn't just any old angel, not some guardian angel, not some cherub, not some seraphim that came and shut the mouth of the lion. It was God's angel, the angel of the Lord, the same figure that met Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire that was the pre-incarnate Jesus is the same one, the pre-incarnate Jesus who met Daniel in the lion's den and shut the mouth of the lion. This remarkable truth that God doesn't extinguish the fires, doesn't prevent us from going into the fires or the lion's den, but ultimately God meets us in the middle of the fires, meets us in the middle of the lion's den, regardless of the reason that we get there in the first place, to reveal to us that we can actually, we can be faithful in the fire because fires and lions aren't more powerful than our God. And Daniel knows it. He has this experience just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had this experience. And he says, he goes on, Verse 23, then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him. Echoes of in Daniel 3 where it says their clothes weren't burned. There was not even burn marks on their bodies. There wasn't even the smell of smoke on their clothes. In the same way, the King Nebuchadnezzar saw that for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now King Darius sees for Daniel no harm. A great reminder that no matter what we experience in life, isn't more powerful than God's love, God's strength, God's protection, God's provision. And then verse 24, the king gave a command and those who had accused Daniel were brought and they were thrown into the den of lions. They, their children, their wives, before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones to pieces. One of those horrific scenes in the Hebrew scriptures that, that communicates there is something that can happen that has the potential to be so powerful, to be so incinerating, to be so all-consuming that actually has no power for those that experience God's faithfulness and God's provision in it. And in this case, what we're talking about is persecution. There is this great fear. I know, I experience it too. That if we follow Jesus faithfully, what I'm not talking about is being annoying for Jesus or turning something that uh, isn't that important that God loves and makes it the ultimate thing more important than all the other things that God calls us to. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about there is this fear that when we faithfully follow God, that people won't like us, that we won't get promoted, we won't get the part, we'll be criticized, we'll be misunderstood. And that is a very real thing. We need to acknowledge that it is a fire, but we're not called to avoid the fire. We're not called to live lives just privately so that we never experience persecution. Nor are we called to retaliate and fight the fire of persecution with counter persecution. I see this play out all the time where one group persecutes another, then the other group retaliates by persecuting the other back. And as followers of Christ, we are called to live a different way. We're never called to retaliate eye for eye, tooth for tooth, like for like, hate for hate, persecution for persecution. But Jesus calls us to love, to serve, and to faithfully follow Jesus. Okay, so this, this scene in Daniel, I believe, gives us a great definition, a great picture of what it looked like for him. But also, what is the anatomy of persecution for us today? We saw it for Daniel. What could it look like for us? If you have your Bibles, go to John chapter 15, one of the remarkable sections in Scripture where Jesus, on one hand, uses an imagery of 
the essential nature of who he is in our lives. He begins John 15 with, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. What he's saying is that who you are, your security, your peace, your joy, your satisfaction, your salvation, your very identity is in me. The moment you forget that, you can do nothing. The moment you think that you can do anything just because you're good, uh, because God should bless you, you're not abiding in Christ. You're not deeply relying on, profoundly remembering that who you are is who God says you are. And out of the overflow of that identity, you can then move out of the world with great humility, with great courage. He says, the moment you forget that, you can do nothing. And what's remarkable is he then moves into a section about persecution. And I wonder sometimes if in knowing what they were to face in the first century, what we will face today and what we'll continue to be facing in the future, we need to be reminded that when we begin with Jesus, not only will persecution rise up in our life, but also it is the great strengthener, the great anchor, the great reminder that even when the fires of persecution come up, we need to abide in Christ. We need to rely on Christ. Okay, so the three things that I see, let me read them first and then we'll dive in. The first is this, the world persecutes us. The world persecutes Christians, number one, because it hates Jesus. We'll get to that in a moment. Number two, the world persecutes followers of Christ because it doesn't consider Christians their own. We'll get to that in a moment. And finally, the world persecutes followers of Jesus because they personally don't know God. Okay, let me read through this in John chapter 15. Again, would love for you to go there in John 15, verse 18. It simply says this, if the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. Now, what's interesting here, Jesus says, if the world hates you, but later on, Jesus says, do not be surprised when you face persecution. Paul says it, you're going to face persecution in this life. Peter says, you're going to face persecution in this life. But Jesus is introducing the idea. This is one of the most significant moments where Jesus introduces the idea of persecution and he uses the word hatred and he says, if the world hates you, Know that it hated me first. Now, what's interesting is that when actually you study the life of Jesus and you, you study the teachings of Jesus, on one hand, the gospel writer John says two things about him. In the very beginning, John chapter one, he says that he was full of both grace and truth. And I love that imagery because it doesn't say that he was balanced in grace and truth. You know, on a scale, if you put a grain of sand on one side and a grain of sand on the other side, it's balanced. So John doesn't say he was balanced in grace and truth. He doesn't say, you know, he's just got a little bit of grace and a little bit of truth. He says he was full of grace and truth. It's like the volume knob turned to 11, turned all the way up of both grace and truth. It's like two singers singing at full volume that this beautiful reality of two distinct things actually comes together in this beautiful harmony at full volume. So on one hand, Jesus was so filled with grace and he extended grace when others didn't. He extended mercy when others didn't. He extended forgiveness when others didn't. So in some ways, people were confronted and actually hated his grace. They saw him extending love and inclusion and grace to people that, let's say, the religious leaders had no time for, had no grace for, had no mercy for, who, who believed were untouchable, who were so, who, they were unclean. And Jesus, on one hand, was hated by the religious leaders because of his full-on grace. But he wasn't just full-on grace, lacking truth. He was full-on grace while also being full-on truth. 
And what's interesting, again, in that culture, whenever somebody would say something, if you agreed with it, you would say, amen. You know, we've kind of fallen into this practice and habit, perhaps not even knowing why we say amen, like it's just something we're supposed to say as insiders, right? But actual fact in that time and period in culture and in history, when you said amen, you were basically agreeing with something. You were saying, that's true. I believe that. I affirm that. And typically rabbis, when they would teach, would offer their interpretation of the Torah, the Hebrew scriptures, and people, disciples, would respond with amen. And sometimes there would be debates where multiple rabbis and multiple disciple groups of each of those rabbis would teach. And there would be great deb debates on the interpretation of the Torah. I love, I, I have a, a, a rabbi friend. He, I love how he says this. He says, you know, Christians, they use scripture to end conversations. But we Jews, we use scripture to start conversations. And I think that that's so healthy for us all that we, as followers of Christ, need to learn from that perspective that actually scripture is so vast and so broad and so beautiful that we should allow it to, to teach us and grow us and to sharpen us and to shape us and that we should discuss it, not use it as an, a weapon, as an arrow, as a sword, but ultimately that we would be transformed by it. And in community, we would be sharpened in all these perspectives, ultimately knowing that we stand under the authority of Scripture. And so, again, the rabbis would say things and then uh, the students would say amen if they agreed. Now, Jesus was altogether different. A Jewish first century rabbi, he chose his disciples, which never happened. Other rabbis were chosen by their disciples. Jesus went out and he chose his disciples. No other rabbi had ever done that. And who he chose were essentially dropouts from the rabbinical schools. You see, as a young child, especially as a male child, you were versed in the Torah, the Hebrew scriptures. You had to memorize it. And there was all these things. And if you didn't pass, if you didn't measure up, you ultimately went back to your parents' profession. Here we have fishermen, tax collectors, a variety of people who many believe, scholars believe, were dropouts from the rabbinical school system. And Jesus went after them, chose them to follow him completely upside down. Some rabbinical teachers and students hated that, couldn't believe it, accused Jesus, hated Jesus. But what's interesting also, Jesus didn't teach and then have people say amen. He frequently began his teachings by saying, truly, truly, I say to you. Some translations say, verily, verily, I say to you. Some translations say, amen, amen, I say to you. Jesus didn't just have an odd way of speaking. He was making a point. Unlike any other rabbi that gave their perspective that was open for interpretation that could be agreed upon by saying amen, Jesus was saying, amen, amen. What I'm about to say is not open for interpretation, is not open for debate. This is truth embodied. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that's not up for debate. That is a cosmic eternal truth. When Jesus says, verily, verily, I say to you, love your God, love your neighbor as yourself, that is not up for debate. And no wonder why the gospel writer John says that Jesus was full, not just of grace, but was full of truth. And that truth confronted the religious leaders that truth confronted secular society. That truth uh, confronted different people and the socioeconomic status who put their identity and their worth in their riches. Whether it was the rich looking down on the poor or the poor looking down upon the rich. He confronted different worldviews. He confronted the governmental powers. He confronted Caesar, but he always did so full of truth, but also full of grace. He had a tone about him. He had a way about him. The truth didn't break people, but it pierced the heart. I love how scripture says that, that God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It separates uh, spirit and marrow. 
And I often think that God's words, of which all point to Jesus, who is the living word, is so sharp. He's like the sharpest scalpel that could be used for surgery. Perhaps you've heard me say before that the the best surgeons are the ones who can get into the issue and get out without doing any other damage on the way. And no good surgeon uses a spoon for surgery. Otherwise, they'd make a mess of things. They try to get to a little artery, but create all this other bludgeoning along the way. And sometimes we don't allow Jesus, who is full of truth, to express truth through us. And it's almost like we're speaking into the world with the bluntness of a spoon. And in trying to help, sometimes we bludgeon people. And God longs for so much more for us in our lives. And Jesus, full of grace and truth, had this ability to just get to the right to the heart of the issue. But the reality is that Jesus, as truth embodied, ultimately confronts every single person on the planet. Because we are all part of the world. We need to be very careful to separate, uh, to not separate Christians from the rest of the world. No, no, we're all part of the world. The book of Romans says that all people have fallen short. The book of Isaiah says that no one seeks after God in their own strength. No one is righteous. No one measures up. And in many ways, when we are the Lord of our own lives, when it's our kingdoms that we want to build, the truth of Jesus confronts us in such a way that our initial reaction is to hate Jesus. Who loves to be told? You'll never measure up in a culture that wants to lift everybody up. But the truth is, is we will never measure up. People hate hearing that. The world hates hearing that. And yet Jesus says, truly, truly, this is not up for debate. You can never earn God's love through your works, through your deeds, but I'm full of grace. Even though you don't measure up, I have come to lay down my life for you to give my life as a ransom for many, for who also should put their faith in me. I will give them life and life to the full, that my righteous record will be given to you and I will take your sin away. And so this truth, you could say it this way, it confronts everything in the world. Uh, The truth of Jesus, it confronts socialism, communism. It, it, It confronts individualism. It confronts cultures that believe that freedom should be had at the expense of others. It confronts uh, segregating people into different categories. It confronts this idea that some people are better than other people. It confronts some people's uh, view of themselves. It it confronts some people's views of uh, other people. It confronts, it confronts, it confronts. And as a result, we can have this hatred towards Jesus. And Jesus is saying, that the world hates you if you are a follower of me because ultimately they hate me. That the truth of who I am, if it's expressed through you and if it's done in accordance with who I am in the name of Jesus, in the ways of Jesus, expressly through the heart of God, it's not you that they hate. They hate the truth that they are in desperate need of a savior They're in desperate need of moving beyond themselves and not just living for themselves to give themselves on behalf of other people. They're going to hate all my teaching. And so my question is, is how did Jesus respond when people hated him? He simply loved them to the fullest extent and at the greatest cost. And we can be faithful in the fire when we are persecuted by simply loving people, giving our lives to them. Holding on to the truth, but holding on to the grace that flows through us. See, this is where I think we, we go from one extreme to the other. We can be all truth and no grace, or all grace and no truth. Jesus was full of both grace and truth, and he longs to dwell in us. It's not about us imitating Jesus, but allowing Jesus to be uh, flowing through us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the first is that the world persecutes us because it hates Jesus. Number two, the world persecutes because they don't consider Christians as their own. Again, in John 15, Jesus goes on. He says, If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. 
You see, something happens as you move throughout life where people consider you their own. You're one of us. And these organizations, these worldviews, these identities can play out in families of origin, can play out in uh, a socioeconomic status. We see these play out along racial lines, along political worldviews, uh, nationalistic identities, citizenships, uh, levels of education, where people say, oh, you're one of us. And often when there's this view of you're one of us, it also is this idea of this is what it means to be one of us. And ultimately, Jesus says, when you put your faith and trust in me, you are not owned by your family of origin. You're not owned by your political party. You're not owned by your gender, not owned by your race, not owned by your socioeconomic status. You're not owned by your level of education. You're not owned by your company. You're not owned by anyone. You belong to me. And ultimately, if you live your life following me, what I will call you to will look out of bounds from some of these groups that want to call you their own. You will love people differently. You have a different level of patience. You will speak a truth that isn't valued within this group. You'll extend grace to people that typically are an extended grace too. And ultimately, people will hate you because you might love some things that they love, but not be passionate about other things. What's so interesting, as I see, is that Christians, uh, we don't allow God to own us and to have a holistic view of our lives, and we settle for other identities, other groups, and we miss out on the full vision that God has for all of humanity. And we might be drawn towards certain things that God is drawn towards, but not drawn towards other things because ultimately we are owned by something smaller. So for example, I'll, I'll give a, uh, a hot topic practical example. In our current situation, uh, there is this divide that I see as it relates to pregnancy. And it seems like people fall, generally speaking, from a worldly point of view into one of two camps. You're pro-life, which means in our context in 2022, you're all about the life of the baby. And I often see it at the expense of the mother. And there's another side that's all about women's rights. And in some ways, I see this often at the expense of the unborn child. And I see all this argument, all this animosity, all this hatred, all this persecution and Jesus is saying, don't be owned by one of these groups that have this black and white view that you have to love one at the expense of the other. That if you allow yourself to belong to me, you will holistically love all life. That you will passionately care about the mother and you will passionately care about the unborn child. And you'll begin to realize just how complex every unique situation, every life with every unborn child is. And there's not going to be one size fits all. And I'm calling you to enter in. I'm calling you to love and to serve and to give your life for and to advocate and to, to, to be able to provide resources and opportunities and sacrifice on the sake. And you will find yourself when you love women and moms who find themselves in unexpected pregnancies while also loving the unborn child, certain groups at an earthly level will say, you're not one of us. It's one or the other. And that's just one example among many. We've somehow fallen into this view that you either care for the environment or you care for individual people's freedom. When somehow we've lost the vision that God has that every person's choice matters and that we should sacrifice and fight for individual freedoms, but never at the expense of other people, and we should care for God's creation. You will find yourself as you are a follower of Jesus, practicing the way of Jesus, that it is this holistic view of all of life that doesn't fit nice and neatly into different categories, and people will consider you not their own, and they will persecute you. They will call you a traitor. They'll say that you're compromising. And ultimately, what did Jesus do? when he wasn't owned by people. 
when even people like Peter tried to own him and said, no, no, Jesus, you can't do this. Jesus knew that his entire life was in the hands of God, that he belonged to God. He constantly came to do the will of God the Father. He never compromised. Even when the closest people to his life tried to own him and steer him, even when the religious leaders tried to own him and steer him, even when the governmental leaders tried to own him and steer him, Jesus so faithfully followed God. And he continued to love with integrity full of both grace and truth. And then finally, uh, the world will persecute us because they don't personally know God. It's a lack of knowledge. And this remarkable reality Jesus talks about in verse 21, but they will do all these things to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. Jesus lived his life in such a way that people couldn't comprehend why he would do it. And ultimately, he did all these things so that people would come to know in a personal way, in an intimate way, the living God. And as they came to know the living God, full of both grace and truth, this great mystery of God, they began to understand why he did the things that he did. And it made sense. It came together. But before that relationship, before that knowledge, it didn't make sense. It didn't line up. It didn't fit the puzzles of how the world views things. And I love in John chapter 17 that Jesus constantly prays. In the longest prayer recorded in scripture by Jesus, he's praying again and again and again. God, I pray that you would make yourself known to my disciples and that through them, the world will come to know who you are. At the end of the day, Jesus was willing to suffer great persecution simply so that people would come to know God. And in discovering who God is, to realize that God says, I've chosen you. I love you. Even in all the ways that you persecuted Jesus, even in all the ways that you've persecuted followers of Christ, I still love you. One of the most beautiful stories of redemption found in Scripture is the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul. He persecuted the church. Jesus shows up on the scene in a vision on the road to Damascus. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's life is changed in an instant. He abandons that life, chooses to follow Jesus. He says stuff like in Philippians 3, all the things, I, I count all of them, all my accolades, all my accomplishments, my heritage, I count all of it as rubbish. I consider a loss for the sake of knowing Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, so therefore I'm gonna endure all persecutions, all hardships, so that people can know God through his son, full of grace and truth. When we walk through the fires, even of persecution, God will meet us, God will walk with us, and people will come to know that they are loved by God, that there is a truth that confronts them, but also a truth that saves them and rescues them, filled with grace. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you're so good and these things are just, I feel in some ways so beyond me, so beyond the little time we have. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in us, cause us to be drawn to scripture, to study more, to long more for your truth and your grace to be full in our lives as we faithfully follow you. In Jesus' name I pray and we say together, amen. You know, some interesting information that not everybody knows that we share within our leadership groups is that 95% of people who join our worship services every single week do so online or on television. A remarkable thing that you are a part of. Our ministry that God has given us over the course of 60 years has had to adapt and change in a variety of ways. And we're in this season right now where we serve people not only on our physical campus, but equip them and gather with them in worship no matter where they live. Some of you, that's here in Los Angeles. Some of you, that's somewhere else in our nation. Some of you are one of the residents of across 191 countries that are now part of the Bel Air Church worshiping experience. And I wanna invite you to consider yourself part of this church family. We'd love for you to consider membership. We'd love for you to consider getting invested in more ways. And also, I'd like to invite you to give your time, your talent, and your treasure as part of the church family. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, it's an opportunity to partner with God with 
what God is doing in this city and around the globe. So would you go to belair.org forward slash give. You can give towards our general fund to extend more and more ministry into the city and around the globe, but also you can choose a drop down menu that enables you to pay and support us specifically in our KCOP broadcast television ministry. However you choose to give, it's an opportunity for you to lean into this life that God invites you into. God longs for you to simply give back to what God is doing because God first gave to you. So as you give, be blessed. Do so with generous hearts and do so with gratitude and joy that God is going to multiply your gift exponentially for God's kingdom purposes. Again, thank you and may God bless you on this day. Friends, not only as we wrap up this service, but this sermon series, a reminder that you can go back to our YouTube channel and get caught up on any of the things that you might have missed. And while you're on YouTube, I encourage you to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we start a brand new sermon series next week. But also know that we have a website that longs to equip you to follow Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. No matter where you live, here in Los Angeles or afar, there's opportunities for you to get more connected in the life of the church and everything on our website is aimed to draw you closer in a community and to a life of following Jesus. Follow us on social media, a lot going on this week and know that you are loved deeply by God, by us as a church and we're praying for you as we follow Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. God bless you and we'll see you soon.